Cohen, an artist so rare that when he emerged onto the music scene in the late 1960s, his work didn't appear to draw from any known tradition, with no recognizable forebears and no scene to encapsulate him. His melodies are very different. His melodies are uniquely Leonard's. There's no real direct line of musical influence that I can hear. These songs are staggering. They're staggering. Yet both as a writer and a musician, Cohen was drawing inspiration from the past. And these influences fused with Cohen's own sensibilities to create a unique body of work. There are these multiple influences, but what's really important with Leonard is their remaking into his own individual work. Whether it's the influence of the beats, whether it's the influence of Chanson and Jacques Brel, all of these things, although on the surface, they might look like a kaleidoscope, a jumble of different philosophies and intellectual ideas drawn from a myriad of different sources. I think Cohen does actually bring them all together into a very coherent and unified philosophy. Songs of Leonard Cohen. Issued in 1967, it was one of the most startling debuts of the decade. Yet in a year that saw the emergence on record of a number of artists, including The Doors, Jimi Hendrix and David Bowie, Cohen's noticeably stood apart from the crowd. The work of a 33-year-old Canadian who was clearly not a product of the counterculture. I think it was immediately evident that Cohen was quite different from anything else around. He was in the folk scene, if you like, but he certainly wasn't of it. He comes from a quite different place. He's a, a very worldly man by the time he appears on the musical stage, uh, and he brings with him a whole raft of influences that uh, uh, were very unusual, if not unique, in the world of rock and roll at that time. I loved you in the morning Our kisses deep and warm Your hair upon the pillow Like a sleepy golden storm Yeah, many love before us I know we are not new In city and in forest They smile like me must try your eyes are soft with sorrow hey that's no way to say goodbye and I think the other thing you have to remember is that Dylan was writing these extraordinary songs at this time but for example Joni Mitchell hasn't arrived by the time the first Leonard Cohen album comes out. Uh, so you've got, you've got the people who've come out of the protest folk movement, the, the, the Tom Paxtons and the Phil Oaks, Tom Rush, Tim Buckley, um, but they're quite different. I think with, with the emergence of Cohen, you, you really do see the, the beginnings of that introspective troubadour movement that came to the fore in the early 1970s. This introspection was due, in part, to Cohen's artistic background. Unbeknown to many record buyers who were drawn to the sparse beauty of the compositions, the emotional depth of the lyrics, and the haunting intimacy of Cohen's voice, he was, in fact, a celebrated Canadian writer. Between 1956 and 1966, four books of his poetry and two novels had been published in his native country, and the success and occasional notoriety of these works made Cohen a prominent figure on the Canadian literary scene. And although he would soon become more acclaimed and recognized internationally as a singer and songwriter, the influences and inspirations he found from within the world of poetry and his understanding of the power of the written word would crucially inform his musical output as well. The poetry is very important. I don't think it's separable from the songs. I kind of see them as flip sides of the same coin. Uh, but there, there is a tremendous continuity, even from his very earliest work in the mid-50s 
you can go through the first book, Let Us Compare Mythologies, 1956, and just about everything in later Cohen is in some way or other prefigured in that book. So I think there's a huge continuity, and I think that you mean, the obvious overlaps are there, that many of the songs are based on earlier poems. There is the same care for language, the compulsive revision that goes, that goes into so many of his songs. Uh, that meticulous craftsmanship which he, which he brings to songwriting, which seems to me a kind of direct carryover from the poetry. Born into a middle-class Jewish family in Montreal, Canada, Cohen had first become interested in poetry while at high school, penning his first lines of verse and discovering the work of many influential figures during his mid-teens. Yet it was while he was at university that this interest developed into both a fully-fledged passion and a potential career. His real exposure to poetry and his interest in it occurs when he's an undergraduate at McGill. He starts off to become a law student, like so many of us. And then we see the light and we turn into other directions. And he had one or two critical professors, one of them, uh, Louis Dudek, who was a professor of comparative literature. And Leonard took at least two, maybe three courses from Louis Dudek. And he was important because Dudek was introducing him to French poetry, to many important figures that were way beyond Canada. And this is where Leonard really sees what you can do with language. He also became involved through some literary magazines with the more senior voices in Canadian poetry, particularly F.R. Scott, who was professor of constitutional law at McGill, but a very, very significant poet. He began to sense there was a tradition to poetry, and it was an important tradition but most importantly, a European tradition. It took him outside of Canada, but then if he turned a little to the right, he could see, well, here's a Canadian poet, here's another Canadian poet, this is what they're doing. More importantly, this is who they are. And for him, it was as much the models and the examples, as well as the feelings that became so important. And these twin inspirations, the classical world of European poetry and the contemporary Canadian literary scene, would be key elements in the development of Cohen's own writing. Yet although he gained a wealth of knowledge studying both forms of poetry during his university education, the writer from whom he drew the most influence was one he had discovered before entering McGill, the Spaniard Federico Garcia Lorca. Federico García Lorca was a Spanish poet born in 1898 and died in 1936 at the age of 38 and was the preeminent poet of his generation, poet and playwright. In his short life, he really only wrote for about 19 years. He explored popular forms of Spanish literature, puppet plays, popular songs, deep song, gypsy song. He's a poet of absence. He's deeply aware of, of the importance of letting silence uh, be part of a poem, and, and of, that what's not said is as important, if not more important, than what is said. And you can see in some of his early works, poem of the deep song, um, poems called Songs and Sweets, where he's really paring things down to the essence and just getting down to these uh, powerful images that kind of leave you thinking and wondering. Um, but, but that's the richness of, of the poem because of what's unsaid. The labyrinths that time creates vanish. Only the desert remains. The heart, fountain of desire, vanishes. Only the desert remains. The illusion of dawn and kisses vanish. Only the desert remains. Undulating desert. Lorca was an elegist. He touches on the issues that con 